when my visit to Bulgaria was planned, I requested to present the lecture on the former Soviet Union space program. This is really important in terms of some historical highlights and because I've been for years a part of the Soviet space program in terms of planning and implementation of many missions, it was it's a great challenge to me and I was really pleased just to accept such an invitation. But contemplating about this lecture, I thought that historical highlights are certainly very important. They should be instrumental for the current activity for the project for projecting the future. So I a little bit change the original title of the lecture. So this is Soviet Russia space history, current and future activity. And this is important in order you would not uh, leave this audience having a wrong idea that space activity terminated in Russia. This is absolutely not the case. We have still quite good missions and also quite reasonable and very challenging planning for the future. What I am going to tell you today, this is a short outline. This is historical facilities, launcher, post hoc being lifted before to be launched. So this is very briefly just what I'm going to tell. Some historical roots, first satellite in Kagari, robotic lunar and planetary exploration. I will be most focused on this part of the former activity. Because as I said, I've been involved in the many Soviet endeavors, including robotic and piloted missions, but my principal interest was concentrated on the robotic program. And so I will tell you mostly the stories about this branch of the activity. So robotic lunar and planetary exploration, and then I divided in the two main principal uh, periods of this activity, the early years, uh, something like about first 15 years uh, after the launch of the first satellite, then the years which basically completed the period of the Soviet space program, and then the new uh, stage, new phase of the activity in current Russia and uh, into modern Russia, and this Phobos group. And then I will touch upon some lessons learned that we have been extracted, some very important experience, which sort like now as a highlight for the future activity, and this is the current and future Russian space program. Suddenly, I have to start with a historical event which dramatically changed the, the, the whole uh, not only existence, I would say also the prosperity of the human beings, of the mankind. That was the launch of the first artificial satellite and it just paved the road for the absolutely new page in the mankind history. This first satellite was very simple by design. It basically included only very simple radio transmitter to pick up the signal in the uh, megahertz uh, wavelengths and it was also suddenly accumulators in order just to supply energy and also it was quite simple thermal control. So as I said this manifested the new humans activity 
And the next step was the first man in space. It was Gagarin flight only four years later. The first satellite was launched in the Soviet Union in October, 4th October of 1957, and Gagarin flights occurred on 12th of April of 1961. on the future pilot admissions and just I remember him like a very simple which is absolutely fantastic smile and this just collected several pictures of him and this is the Vostok vehicle and the capsule which was returned back on Earth and was this really historical event in the mankind progress. This is the two main people who contributed to the beginning and implementation, development of our space activity. This was really genius people. It was Serge Karelov and Stislav Kelvich. They uh, opened the, this new phase of the human activity, space exploration. Karelov was the chief designer, Stislav Kelvich was the chief theoretician. And uh, I had also personally great chance to know both. I knew not so well, say, Korolev, I just only met several times, met, communicated with him, but I worked for 20 years very closely with Mstislav Kelvich. Most people, Sergei Korolev and Mstislav Kelvich, were persons of extraordinary intellectual capacity. They were real genius. I had unique chance to work closely to Mstislav Kelvin and uh, this is probably my most important heritage even in my personal career because I assisted him and he guided me and it was great lessons learned which projected all my future life, my career. So I address him like my great teacher. Looking back in our past, in space exploration in the former Soviet Union, I just display here two books, probably most important of everything I did, I wrote during my life. One of the most valuable book published in 1981 is a book written together with my teacher, with Mstislav Hilde, called Space Research. This is a summary of all our activity since the beginning of space era until late 70s. Uh, it's already, I guess, very difficult to find out, but if you, you will have a chance, I think you will admire the whole page of the activity described in this book. The second one was published much later. It appeared the first time in English, published by Springer Praxis, and it was written with my American colleague, Wesley Congress. Wesley Congress was former deputy NASA administrator for more than 10 years, and he was responsible for years for the American Lunar and Planetary Program. And when it was great competition motivated by the Cold War, 
just in the second half of the last century, we basically chased each other. But we just preserved very good relationship. We just not only colleagues, let me say we are friends. It was project suggested by OSLI, and we decided to write to, to write such a book, which called Soviet Robots in the Solar System, Mission Technologies and Discoveries. Well, most recently, only beginning of this year, the book was translated into Russian and published by Nauka Publishing House. Possibly, this is the most comprehensive and objective study of the history of outer space exploration with the robotic systems, robotic spacecraft in the former Soviet Union. And uh, also involving not only scientific achievements, but also robust engineering and innovative technologies. This book, I just coming here, I give it to space challenges. Okay, let me briefly describe the, the main phases of the former activity. And as I already said, it was mostly motivated by the Cold War standards, but it really benefited and eventually to the whole mankind. This is the several rocket launchers which just compare American this avant-garde Jupiter C, Atlas Agena, and some modification of the Vostok launcher. It's a Luna with better capacity than it was for Vostok launcher, which allowed us in the end 50s and the beginning of 60s to undertake the first launch uh, to the moon. And this is the modified buzzer Molnia rocket, much more capable, which allowed us also to undertake not only just fly towards the moon, but also to land on the moon. As I said, the Soviet robotic lunar and Earth exploration program worked as a part of the Cold War. By the way, some uh, slides in this presentation I took from our joint paper presented two years ago to the special conference, uh, which called 50 years of the solar system exploration which was held by historical department, organized historical department of NASA, and was held in Washington, D.C., and so jointly with West countries, we submitted a paper, just mostly based on our published book. Our efforts and our even successes in space exploration in the very beginning of space era, they stimulated American efforts as well. And it was just in the book uh, summar we summarize a tale of adventure, excitement, and suspense. As I said, a very objective book, and it's very accurately described not only successes, but many failures we had along this track. And, uh, well, unfortunately, until most recently, uh, many events were unknown outside the closed cycle of the Soviet uh, secrecy, secrecy shroud. It was under secrecy for the long time. Soon after the launch of the first satellite, just uh, the era or age of robotic lunar exploration began, was over. And suddenly, it was quite a firm road and not an easy, not the plain sailing. It was just uh, many, many failures we met along this track because everything was absolutely new and it was not easy to accommodate many requirements because many things were absolutely unknown and we were just pioneering this program and trying to reach progress. But among these failures, which summarized listed here, it was also very important successes. First of all, it was Luna 1. It was already on January 1959, uh, which was the first spacecraft leaving Earth but it missed, unfortunately, lunar impact. But it was the first time it manifested that the second space velocity really can be accomplished. Luna 2, first lunar impactor, which happened the same year uh, in uh, September. And it just impacted 
uh, heated the moon and it was at that time also great achievements. And especially important and successful was Luna 3rd. It was circumlunar flyby and the first far side images. Uh, let me remind you that the moon faced the Earth the same side permanently. So we had very, very weak idea about how the far side of the moon looked like. And images returned back, not very high quality, but still this is not uh, free. And this is the first image of the lunar far side returned back to Earth. And it was at that time great excitement. Two years later, it was age of the beginning of robotic planetary exploration program. And it was the first vehicles and I had chance to work with this vehicle in my early career. It was just first vehicle targeted to Mars and also to Venus, to the closest planets to our Earth. So, it was also the first minor flight with Molnia rocket, which I showed you earlier. Because vehicles didn't reach their destination, they failed along this route. But it was opening just a planetary exploration. A little bit more successful was the new so-called 2MD planetary program, and uh, it was new, so to say, modular design of the spacecraft. This is the first Mars 1, and this is the Venus. Uh, and, uh, well, we just launched them, and uh, again, they didn't reach their target, but still, we have extremely important uh, experience with this launch. It was followed by Serge Karolov and Stislav Kevlin's dream how to soft land on the moon. It was a really important task because nobody yet accomplished this goal, but uh, it turned out not very simple. And several missions failed along the track and uh, because of attitude control or retro rocket failed and so so on. But it's very important, as is sketching here, that at the first time we used very robust technology with airbag pincher, you know, and airbag was much later utilized by Americans. We started with the Pathfinder program toward Mars. But, well, to my regret, it was not even referred about uh, the pioneering concept of the uh, pioneering uh, efforts with this concept from the former Soviet Union. Anyway, it, despite uh, many failures, we still didn't weaken our efforts and we tried to uh, accomplish eventually the goal of soft landing. Well, let me say, just alongside with the lunar program, we continue our efforts with the planets Mars and Venus. Unfortunately, it was never accomplished during these years, just as, uh, you know, to approach even or fly by uh, the planets with the operating instruments. But en route to Mars and Venus, it, we used the moon like additional component, additional target of this mission. And several missions that's called Zone, Zone 1, 2, 3, and very good quality pictures of the Moon at the first time were returned back to the Earth. And in particular, much, much better resolution of the far side of the Moon, mostly continental in its landforms. Probably all these missions the most successful was the first attempt really to reach Venus. And it was Venera 2 and Venera 3. One, it was flyby, and the second was just in back. Uh, unfortunately, they failed just before reaching uh, the target. Because of the overheating, we couldn't at that time uh, properly and accurately uh, estimate just that the real heating when approaching the sun. So it was overheating and failed because of the poorly designed thermal control system. We reached success with the moon. It was done because of the very wise decision of 
the Korolev and Kelnich to transfer the, the, the whole documentation and basically the whole experience which were gained at, by that time uh, from Korolev Design Bureau, Korolev Rocket Corporation to the new established facility. It was Lavochkin Enterprise headed by the extremely enthusiastic and very clever designer by George Babakin. It happened in, at the end of 1965. It was just facility with absolutely fantastic great experience in building a military aircraft which uh, contributed to our victory during the Second World War, the Lavochkin uh, fighters. And uh, this experience turned out extremely important to benefit space program. Since then, Lavochkin Enterprise is one of the leading measures in our space exploration. And this success happened on February, in the beginning of February 1966. It's a soft landing, great achievement. And this is a picture of the panorama of the moon nearby the Luna 9 landing site. So, and this is the configuration of the lander with very clever petals which is uh, disclosed when, uh, after, soon after landing. So, it was quite stable position standing on the surface. The success on the moon was followed by the launch of the first lunar orbiters and it was slightly modified the original concept of the lunar vehicles for soft landing but it was very important step forward also because cycling the moon we collected and returned back a lot of very important pictures and it was motivated mostly by the collecting such images in order to select most reasonably future landing site for the pilot mission because the 60s is just at the time of the absolutely fantastic moon race between Soviet and American um, systems basically even social system, political social system not just in technology 